When you're buying tubing for bicycle frame building, you can get straight gauge tubes and you can get bicycle specific tubing that comes pre-bent, formed, tapered, budded, all this stuff. I'm gonna uh, give you the practical information you need to know about that subject. So here I have a collection of bike specific tubes. These two are chain stays for the lower rear tubes of the bike. This is a seat stay for the upper rear of the bike. These three are different kinds of fork blades for the steel fork front end of the bike. These two are main tubes and uh, you know the, the top tube, down tube, seat tube. This, uh, these two here are head tubes. So these are where your, your, your uh, steerer for your fork passes through there. There's some other bicycle specific tubes. And so in the, you know, these are all 4130 steel, more or less, slightly different alloys. Some of them are heat treated. And uh, in in the larger industry of 4130 steel tubing, you can buy straight gauge tubing. In the United States, that'll come in fractional inches. So the outside will be five eighths of an inch or inch and an eighth or whatever it is. And so you have the outside diameter and then you have a wall thickness. And so in the United States, there's common wall thicknesses, 35 thousandths, 45 thousandths, 058, 065, whatever. There's these different standard wall thicknesses and maybe you can find uh, some off the wall ones from different places. But in the bike world, it gets a little bit more specific and so if you're building in a material like steel, there's a lot of options from a handful of different uh, tubing supply manufacturers. You have Dedichai, Reynolds, um, True Temper doesn't exist anymore. You have Verawall, there's, uh, there's um, uh, Tange uh, was one. And so there's different companies that make tubing and it solves and addresses specific issues. So. Um, you know, this here is an S-Bend seat stay. Like I make a tube bender so you could take a straight tube and you could put two opposing bends in it and get this sort of thing. But if you go to Nova Cycle Supply or a lot of the places that supply bike tubing, you can get pre-bent and pre-formed tubing, which is great if you're getting started and you don't have the resources to buy those kinds of tools, you can get the tubes that come pre-formed like that. And uh, it just means you have a little bit less control over the process. You know, for forks, uh, you know, so so here's an example like, you know, this this one was brazed into a fork before and then I unbrazed it. I don't remember why. But anyway, um, you know, you have your, your dropout tip on the end. So it's a tapered tube and then it gets ovalized on the end also. And uh, when they do this, I think uh, they start with a round tube and then they swage it to get the taper. And I don't understand exactly how that works, but, but there's a machine that's way too expensive for individual frame builders to usually be able to afford. And uh, I, I understand it's loud and, and kind of violent and it, it, it puts a taper onto your tubing. And then, uh, and then the ovalization probably happens in some sort of press where it, you know, smushes it uh, to give it that, that oval shape. And so, you know, you could maybe do those things yourself if you had all the tools and equipment, but most frame builders, they're just looking to put the tubes together, custom for their customer's spec, and they don't need to own all that equipment if, uh, if, if it can be done for them. And you would want tapers and you would want oval ovalization and stuff in some of these tubes. Similarly, this one is a ovalized chainstay and it's, it's bent along the oval part of it, and that is a very tricky bend to do. You need uh, bending dies that hug the shape of that oval. It's also tapered over that same length, and so uh, this would be tricky to do without a very specialized set of bending dies uh, that most people are not going to be able to build for themselves or to be able to buy for this profile tubing, and so it's great that this comes with the S-Bend already put on it. So another really common feature of bicycle tubing that you're not gonna see with straight gauge tubes is budding. So this one here is a main tube for a bike frame and budding is where usually uh, internal budding is where the outside diameter of the tube is consistent over its length. However, the wall thickness changes over its length. And so like something like this much on either end of the tube will be meatier. It'll have a heavier wall thickness, then it'll have a taper, and it'll transition to being a thinner wall in the middle. Right, and so that changes the characteristic of the tubing as you're riding it. You know, it makes the frame a little bit less like a tank, and maybe it gives it some more character or whatever. You know, uh, depends on uh, how it's applied. And I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. I'm just trying to relay the uh, the sort of layman's understanding of this stuff, so you know how to navigate it if you're new to it. Uh, so you know, by removing that middle, uh, some of the wall thickness in the middle, it becomes lighter weight, and um, and so a lot of tubing is butted. Even some of this uh, tapered and ovalized and stuff will start budded and then they'll do the swaging and then they'll do the bending and stuff. So yeah, main tubes a lot of times will be straight uh, and they will have a consistent outside diameter. Also sometimes, especially on seat tubes of a bike, 
um, you will see at the top where you're going to do your welds to your top tube and your seat stays and the seat post is going to pop in there, you'll see that there's an external butt. And they do that sometimes because they want most of the tube along its length to be fractional inch so that it will fit into your fixtures and your tube blocks and stuff. And then up at the top, they want it on the inside diameter to fit a seat post. And on the outside diameter, uh, it doesn't really matter so much right there what the diameter of it is on the outside. They want it to have a thick enough wall so, uh, so that the, the weld joints and stuff are strong. And so they'll do an external butt because the inside is a driving dimension. It's the diameter of the seat post and getting a good fit there. And then uh, the, the wall thickness is a driving dimension because you need enough meat there. And the, the outside diameter in this case becomes a driven dimension. You Maybe you would like it to be the size of a fractional inch tubing block or something, but that's less important than the other two dimensions that are fixed. You know, it needs to fit the seat post. It needs to have enough meat there. So they'll do an external butt on the top of seat tubes. Usually, uh, most most budding on bicycle tubes outside of that usually is internal budding. So this here is a is head tube stock, and this is what you would build uh, for if you know 44 millimeter inside uh, dimension. So if you have a press in headset uh, with cups that get pressed in, and on the bottom you have an inch and a half. Uh, steerer diameter, uh, which is common nowadays with tapered forks, and um, and so anyway, if you're going to build a bike with that standard, you need this tubing, and I think it's 46 or 46.4 millimeters on the OD, and and something like a little bit under 44 on the ID, so that when you ream it after welding, it ends up being at like you know, uh, 44 or whatever the exact spec is. This is an oddball size of tubing and you would not find this from any old uh, 4130, you know, Cromali supplier. So the bike industry needs to have this stuff available for bike builders to be able to make this. Otherwise you'd be buying larger diameter stock with a super duper heavy wall and then you would have to machine it yourself on a lathe, which uh, not everybody has a lathe and it requires, you know, for the taller head tubes, you need a very stout boring bar and it's a whole production you can spend a lot of time on that and you can just buy the tubing that's already the right size um, here's another example this is for the same kind of headset where uh, on the bottom you have your 44 millimeter nominal headset and then on the top it's 34 millimeter and um, you know it's the taper on it so I think um, well you know this it's just a different design but anyway you know this this uh, this is you know made specifically for bike tubing and so all this stuff uh, there's ways around it you could build a whole bike entirely comprised of straight gauge tubing and you can do all your own forming and bending. You can get stuff oversized and then machine it down on a lathe to get it uh, just the profiles that you want if it's not available. But there's a lot of bike specific tubing where people have already engineered, you know, commonly useful stuff that they can sell to the masses. So let's talk about tube sets, right? You go into a bike shop, retail bike shop, and you see this one here has Reynolds 520 or you know old school lug frames always have Reynolds 531. Uh, you, um, what else is there? There's there's a lot of uh, anyway. You know that sticker on the seat tube of the bike to tell you what what the tube set is, right? And um, and that's kind of cool because you know you you get a sense of like how it was made or what it's comprised of or something, but. Uh, in the custom world, you don't need to, to build a whole frame out of just one tube set. You don't need to be brand loyal because the alloys of the different materials within a steel frame or within a titanium and I think usually aluminum frames, you can mix and match. So I'm not an expert on any of this, but I know the way that most people build uh, steel frames is that if you want to, you can mix and match. And I think part of the reason that they do tube sets you know, there's probably a lot of reasons, but with retail bikes in the in the production bike retail world, you know, it's it's like they have a contract with Reynolds or whoever the tubing supplier is, and so they you know they just buy the whole tube set, they get a huge quantity of them, and then it's a marketing decision to put the sticker on there. You know, like the, I remember. Um, uh, first bike shop I worked at sold Jameis bikes and you know the the lower lower steel end uh, you know road bike would have Reynolds uh, 520 or 520 or whatever tube set and then and then the higher end one had 853 uh, steel and you know that was like a a marketing a sales point that you could you know you could talk to your customer about well they're not they're not a metallurgist they don't necessarily know what that means or you know it's maybe not that meaningful to them so I think some of what drives that is a marketing thing uh, you know Columbus Life Columbus SLX there's these different tube sets and there are differences between them uh, but you don't necessarily stick you don't need to stick to one tube set just because it's sold as a tube set I think 
I, I really don't know that much about this stuff. I'm trying to convey the practical information that I have about it. It's, uh, you know, sometimes a tube set or, or a line of tubing, it has to do with the specific metallurgy and the processes like heat treating uh, that go into that tube set. And so you might want to match all of them, but you wouldn't need to necessarily. Maybe the tube set fits your needs really well, except the down tube isn't long enough for the, the big frame that you want to do or whatever it is. You know, there's all these different considerations you have to balance to get the end result. And when you're doing custom, it's pretty cool. You can choose whatever you want so long as it works and you're not limited to doing something. You know, it's, it's on you to market it. You got to market it to your customers. <laughs> you don't need to worry about, well, you know, the marketing department can't do anything with that. Well, that's, you know, that's your job. So, uh, you, you get you get a lot of freedom and you can mix and match and pick and choose what makes sense. You know, if you really like the budding profile of the you know, of the Vera wall tube that you're going to use on your top tube, but then you really like the, you know, the whatever it is, you know, you can mix and match and find what suits your needs best. So, uh, steel in the frame building world really has the most options. A lot of people build with steel, a lot of bikes get made out of steel, and so uh, if you're a frame builder, especially in the United States, there's uh, you know Nova, Nova Cycle Supply, and there's Very Wall, and there's Frame Builder Supply, and there's probably a couple others I can't think of right now, that supply a lot of different options of bike-specific tubing, which is great. When you get into titanium, and you get into aluminum, and uh, uh, you know, I don't know everything about all these different niches. I know a lot more about steel and the way that, you know, the practical considerations for the steel frame builder. Uh, but I don't think there's quite as many options for those, right? And so uh, sometimes you have to make do with straight gauge tubes. You have to machine more of the parts yourself on a lathe. And then you need to, uh, you know, do more of your own tube bending and forming and smushing uh, and that sort of thing. And that's why you see a lot of titanium bike frame builders work primarily out of straight gauge tubing. I know that... Um, uh, you know, there are some offerings out there for titanium tube sets that you can get and I don't know necessarily like how they stack up to what's available from straight gauge because I don't build with titanium primarily, but um, but I just don't think there's as many options. And then, you know, of course, you know, some people will just, they want to build out of uh, straight gauge or they want to, maybe they'll get a, a steel tube like this that's got the oval cross section and the tapers and all that, but rather than, um, rather than buying it pre-bent like this, they'll do their own bending and smushing and forming so they more control over the process. So if you think about the rear end of a bike, let's say you got a mountain bike or a cross bike with fat tires or something, you want to have clearance for the tire, you want to have clearance for the chain ring, you want to have clearance for the chain ring arms, and then you also, with the bends and the way that it fishes through there, you want to have uh, the, the tube as it meets the bottom bracket shell, you, you don't want them to be all the way together in the middle touching each other and you don't want them to be so far outboard that your welds are like coming off the outside edge of your bottom bracket shell. You want them to be in the right spot and same thing with the dropouts. And in order to get to thread the needle to get your chain stays exactly where you want them, you, you know, it, it can help a lot sometimes to have control over the process, to have your own bending and forming capabilities. Uh, but then on the other hand, uh, if, if something off the shelf works, it can save you a lot of time and it can save you from buying and building those tools uh, that you might not necessarily need. The wall thickness profiles are referred to as like 969, 747, 858, that sort of thing. And in this instance, this is a 969 tube and that just means uh, 0.9 millimeters wall thickness right here. If you were to measure the thickness of this tube wall, it's 0.9 millimeters. In the middle of the tube, for the bulk of the length of it, it's going to be 0.6 millimeter wall thickness and then 9 again on the end. So 969 is common, 858 is common. And so if you see that format with the number slash number slash number, that's what that means. And uh, and then, you know, when you get the tubing, you want to make sure that uh, your joints are actually in the butt. So let's say you had a tube that was this long, this is 650 millimeters or something, probably 680, it says that number on here. And uh, you don't want to cut a whole bunch down to get it to length and then be in the center of the tube with no butt. You know, the butts are there to add strength at the end of the tube. Um, and so sometimes they'll do a longer butt on one end than the other. And just knowing where that butt profile is, is important when you go to chop the tube to length and miter it and weld it into your frame. And so one thing that you can do to find those butts, if you, you know, like this has a, a model name on it and I can look up that information. If you didn't have that, uh, you could use a tool called a butt checker. And that allows you to figure out where those butts and the transitions are in your tube. And it's got a great name. They're a lot of fun. I think Todd Farr makes and sells one, and maybe some other people have in the past too. It's a pretty simple tool. You clamp it in your bench vise, 
just to hold on to it. And then it's got like an 18 inch long or so little arm that sticks out with a ball on the end of it. And then another one up above it uh, with a stylus and a dial indicator. And so you slide your tubing in and the dial indicator gives you a, a relative measurement for how thick the wall is. And then when you slide your tubing along, it helps you identify where your transition is because it's, the, it's measuring from the inside of the tube to the top of the tube. So it's measuring your wall thickness directly. And uh, I made one of those tools once and I, I wished it worked a little bit better, but it worked fine. Maybe Todd's is nicer than mine. And so anyway, you can identify sort of where the transitions are uh, from thick to thin along the length of your tube so that you can mark it out quickly without having to reference a spec chart and uh, trust that, you know, this information, you know, you can actually take measurements, which is always the best is to take empirical measurements and then, uh, yeah, mark off the ends of your tube and, you know, know where you're taking your rough cuts from so that what you're left with is uh, the correct application of the tube. Another thing you can do if you're not not sure which end is the the long butt you can try and balance the tube over a balance point like this for instance and try and find where it balances mark that with a sharpie and then measure from either end and then you know if it balanced like this for instance with this side way longer than this side you would know this side must be a lot heavier and that one must be a lot lighter if it's balancing like this for this amount of tube to offset all of that tube this side must be heavier so it must be butted like all the way up to here and it must only be butted like four inches on the other end and so that can help you identify the short butt and the long butt if you don't have for instance if you had sanded off the model number or something or uh, I think these ones are painted from Nova and Columbus and you know a lot of these uh, a lot of these different suppliers they'll paint one end to identify the butt I always forget I, you know I'm not building on a super regular basis and it's it's probably the same marking on all the different brands I always forget which end is the one that's painted <laughs> if it's the long butt or the short butt it might be different between brands probably not but I don't really remember um, so I'll just balance it over something and that helps me identify which end is the long butt so anyway bike tubing is just such a huge topic right there's alloys of material there's different suppliers and grades and qualities there's uh, aluminum and titanium and other materials that I don't even know that much about because I haven't worked with them you know I'm just not the expert on this I just want to pass along the kernel of like the basics of what you might need to know to get going to understand the lingo to understand what's out there and why it exists and what you know what the pros and cons some of that is a framework to get started I hope you found the video really useful and helpful and uh, hit that subscribe button we'll see you on the next one later dudes